HCAM programming is supported by viewers like you and by Star Realty, a real estate brokerage firm specializing in residential real estate sales in and around Hopkinton. Their agents live in town, send their children to Hopkinton schools, serve on local boards, volunteer for local causes, and frequent local business. Hopkinton is where they live, work, and give back. Star Realty. Interviews with Mike Kanoya, the new principal at Hopkinton High School, Ryan Herr with an update from the Metro West Anti-Casino Coalition and Bill Maher leaving Golden Pond after 17 years. All this and more brought to you by Hopkinton's television station, HCAM TV. I'm Michelle Murdoch and HCAM News starts right now. Hopkinton and welcome to HCAM News for the week of July 29th. The Elementary School Building Committee is meeting this week and will be conducting a site walk through Elmwood and Center School properties on Thursday, August 1st. The tour is open to the public and begins at Elmwood at 4 p.m. and is scheduled to end by 6 p.m. In other government news, Town Manager Norman Kamalo invites residents to participate in the online version of Hopkinton's 2013 Citizen Survey. The deadline to complete the survey is Thursday, August 22nd, and the feedback gathered will be used to help the town set benchmarks for service and to enable the selectmen to better set priorities. And from the Treasurer's Office, a reminder that Hopkinton real estate taxes are due Thursday, August 1st. Copies of tax bills are available at taxbillsonline.com. Foxwood, Massachusetts continued its series of public presentations last week with a meeting on July 24th that addressed the social and economic impacts of the proposed Milford Casino. Joining me next is Brian Herr, chairman of the Metro West Anti-Casino Coalition, with an update. We're here again today with Brian Herr to give us another update on the Metro West Anti-Casino Coalition and whatever else is happening in the casino issue. We have to stop meeting like this. It's the summertime, you know. <laughs> I know, huh? Well, we had a good meeting this week uh, down in Milford, um, and then we had our Metro West Anti-Casino meeting last night. Uh, I think things are starting to evolve within the Milford community, which is good. We think, you know, our role has been to try and tell another side of the story or the other side of the story, as the case may be, specific to, to the different issues that have come up uh, for the residents of Milford. And now I can clearly see that the residents of Milford are recognizing that, in fact, there's got to be two or three sides to these stories. And they're doing a good job themselves of really pressing the developers for some answers. Okay, so since we last talked, there were actually two different meetings. Uh, one was water and sewer issues, and then the second one um, that was this week was social and economic. Um, why don't we just review briefly? Uh, water and sewer, I know, is very technical, you know, gallons per day and all that kind of Lots stuff. Lots of numbers. But uh, I think the main point to come out of that was that there were discrepancies or people questioning the facts that were actually presented concerning that. Yeah, the developer stood up and said there's 12 million gallons per day capacity within the Milford wastewater treatment plant itself and the system overall. Uh, that is not factual. There are 4.3 million gallons per day permitted by the state and federal government that they can run through there. If the plant itself can move 12 million gallons of water through there or, or wastewater through there a day, that's one thing. You know, pipes can take all kinds of flow. But what they can treat, and that's what a treatment plant does, that's an entirely different matter, and that's what the discussion surrounded. You know, Foxwoods is doing a very good job putting out numbers that won't get people ruffled, get, get people concerned, because they can just sort of gloss over things and say it's no big deal. But the reality is they're up against it right now in terms of capacity. Foxwoods is going to need a 300, another 300,000 gallons per day to make their casino work. And in order for that to happen, and this is where it gets a little technical, mm -hmm. they have to take out or improve the wastewater treatment plant facility through the inflow and infiltration problem, they have to improve it 1.5 million gallons per day. So for Foxwoods to get 300,000, 
they have to fix the plant and all the pipes associated with the plant feeding into it, they got to remove 1.5 million gallons per day of the inflow and infiltration, which is just storm water coming into the system that really mm -hmm. doesn't belong in there. That's a huge undertaking and will require basically that they rebuild the entire thing. So that will tear up Milford for years. And again, they sort of glossed over that and said, oh, it's no big deal, we'll get it done. Right, but basically a lot of infrastructure improvements required Huge infrastructure to, to make that improvements. Work. Every street in Milford where there's, where there's a sewer pipe will be ripped up and, and torn apart and put back together again over a period of several, you know, many years. Okay, and then this week was social and economic, which when we were chatting before our official interview, you said really had an impact on the, on the crowd that was there the other night. Yeah, the first few meetings, the Milford, res the Milford residents had been uh, listening to the developers' presentations. I think they've been reading the press releases and some of the things that we've been putting out after the fact. Very technical stuff, talking about 12 million gallons versus 4.3 million gallons, what's, what's flow, what's treatment, those, those kinds of things. And it wasn't... Uh, uh, they didn't push back too much during the meetings themselves with Foxwoods. Last night or two nights ago, Wednesday evening, was the social and economic impacts portion of the presentation from Foxwoods. And there the residents really stood up and said, enough. You're glossing over things. You're, you're, you're not giving us you know, the real facts. You're, you're making some stuff up to try and make us feel better. For example, they said that crime will not increase with the development of a casino in Milford. I mean, that's just a ridiculous statement. DUIs will go up, you know, thousands of people will be pulled over, unfortunately, over the course of a year, probably, maybe not a course of a year, but, you know, hundreds and hundreds of DUIs alone coming out of that, that casino will increase, and that's a significant and serious crime that people have to be careful with. All kinds of theft issues will come up as a result of a casino coming into town. There will be drugs, there will be prostitution, all these things happen, and, and the Foxwoods developers stood there and told the residents of Milford there will not be an increase in crime, period. And the Milford residents stood up at the meeting and said, that is absolute, that's not correct. They weren't going to fall They're for not going to fall for that anymore. And it got actually rather heated Wednesday evening, uh, more so than I've seen at any other meeting. It's like they've kind of had enough now and they're, they're starting to call them on everything. Okay. Now, from the MWAC perspective, what have you guys been working on? Well, you know, MWAC made it very clear on the sewer numbers and the water treatment numbers and things of that nature and countered some of the facts that Foxwoods put out there. We got a lot of traction on some of those releases that we put out and got a lot of phone calls from different uh, media outlets across the state. And they're making sure that uh, they adjust their numbers, and they are. Uh, Foxwoods is. Um, we went into this week's meeting on the social and economic issues wondering you know, how it would play. But the, our, our job really is to make sure that the residents of Milford, who ultimately have the vote and have the say, understand both sides of the story. And we had to give them information, we thought, the first few meetings because it wasn't being presented there and they didn't have sort of the background to ask some of those questions themselves. Last night or Wednesday night, we didn't have to do anything. We didn't put a press release out because the Milford residents did a fantastic job pressing Foxwoods for the other side of the story. So, you know, we want to make sure they have all the information in front of them so they can make an informed decision and make an informed vote when the referendum question comes up. On the social and economic issues, we don't have to do much right now because they get it. Okay. And they understand that Foxwoods is just, is just painting a rosy picture here, but reality is a wholly different matter. Okay, so I mean, really, as, they, as Foxwoods presents more information, uh, which they think is beneficial, it's really not going yeah, in their favor. No, not at all. I think the thing is definitely headed south right now. There's a lot of pressure on Foxwoods. In fact, you know, the Foxwoods representatives weren't even at the meeting Wednesday night. Scott Butera wasn't there. David Nunes wasn't there. No one that was working with Foxborough directly here in Massachusetts was at this meeting for whatever reason. It was just their consultants and it was uh, a couple of law firms that were sitting there offering opinions. The other interesting thing was with those folks out of the room, with the Foxwoods representatives oh. out of the room, mm -hmm. the consultants got extremely defensive, they were condescending, they were disrespectful. I mean, if you're selling something, you don't handle yourself in the manner in which they did the other night. And I was really surprised to see the lack of professional uh, approach uh, by, by the Foxwoods team Wednesday evening, too. They were getting a little heat, and they imploded around the issues. They couldn't, they couldn't stand in there and have a meaningful, polite discussion about what was going on. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so anything else residents should know going uh, forward? No, just know that the Foxwoods uh, presentations continue to be very um, uh, optimistic, you know, to the point of ridiculous. They talked about only adding 21 students 
to the Milford schools as a result of this casino oh, I coming saw to that. town. There's 3,000 jobs being created. 2,500 people approximately will take jobs at the casino, a lot of which will come from other areas, move to the area to get these jobs, and they say we're only going to add 21 people or 21 students into the schools. Again, that's a ridiculous claim and something that was pushed back on pretty hard by uh, the folks of Milford. They're just, they continue with their sort of rosy picture approach, uh, but I can clearly see now that the Milford residents have copped on, they're not going to put up with it anymore, and it's going to be very interesting from this point forward until we get to the referendum questions. Okay, and do they have a, a date set for that yet or not? There's been no date set for the referendum that we're aware of. Um, the selectmen still have to decide if it's going to go on the ballot or not. Uh, there's clearly some dissension or, or splits between the selectmen now. You can see that. It's pretty obvious, too. Uh, once they make that determination, they still have a town meeting where they have to do a zoning article, and then they have a referendum question. But none of those dates have been set at this time. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's a, a good update for now. And, again, thank you for coming in and uh, keeping us informed on what's happening. A final meeting on July 31st at Milford High School will focus on environmental and design matters. All meetings are open to the public and any questions or inquiries from Hopkinton residents should be directed to Selectman Brian Herr, Chairman of the Metro West Anti-Casino Coalition. While Hopkinton students are enjoying their summer break, newly appointed Hopkinton High School principal Mike Knoyer is busy at work, but found time for a brief interview with HCAM News to talk about his plans for the new school year. I just thought we could sit and chat um, about what's coming up for the, the school year and what you have planned for the fall. Great. Thanks for the opportunity. <clears throat> um, my three biggest goals really for the year are first I need to get to know the school because even though I was an assistant principal for five years at Hopkinton High School, that was five years ago, mm -hmm. um, so a lot has changed, a lot of the people have changed, um, some of the programming has changed and of course moved forward, so I want to make sure to get to know the school best that I possibly can. Um, and I have a three part plan to get to know the school um, as quickly as possible. The first is to meet with teachers. Um, in small groups and in one-on-one, -on -one, maybe in their departments, to find out from them what they think really works in the school and, and things that could be improved. Okay. Um, and then secondly, the students. Um, you know, they're the heart and soul of the school. Um, so getting to meet with the student leaders is important, the student council kids, the class officers, etc. cetera. Um, and then also to meet with parents. And I think the best way to do that is to invite them into the school. I haven't set dates yet, but um, I will be having uh, you know, sort of principal's coffees or those kinds yep. of things where, where, where parents can come in. And also getting to know parents through the school council. We'll have a school council meeting sometime in September where um, community students and parents can come together as the school council, again, to let me know what works in the school and, and those things that need some attention. What do you think has changed recently? Like say, um, let, let's talk a little bit about technology because I know that's sure. one thing where things are changing. And I, I know one of the achievements in the last couple of years was to get the one-to-one -one laptop program. Right. Um, what do you think of the program? Uh, where do you think it's going to go from here and things like that? Sure. Well, I think, first of all, getting hands, uh, computers in the hands of kids is of critical importance. Um, you know, when we think of the lives of students outside of school and us as adults, we manage our lives through our electronic devices. Um, whether it's banking or you know for a student doing their homework um, and managing their academic lives it's it's um, the way that we work it's the way that we sort of organize our lives so um, the old model of preventing students from doing that always seems so counterproductive to me um, you know we talked a lot about making kids unplug at the schoolhouse doors you know they'd be on the mm -hmm. bus you know, on their smartphones, sort of talking to their friends and organizing their lives, and then we tell them to shut them off when they walked into the school. And that doesn't seem to make sense. It seems counterproductive. Um, if we're really preparing kids for 21st century skills, then we need to give them 21st century tools and allow them to use those as learning tools. So I'm really excited about the one-to-one -one program. Um, we'll be entering our second year this year. So okay. um, all ninth graders and 10th graders will have their computers with them in school. Uh, they'll be expected to have them in class. And teachers will be expected to use them as learning tools in those classes. Okay. It's really exciting stuff. 
Okay, that was my next question. So mm -hmm. once once they have their computer, they keep it. So yes. in four years, everybody will have one. Right, yeah. Well, we have a decision to make about whether or not we want to use next year as our final year mm -hmm. um, and get um, both of the remaining classes um, on board okay. uh, to sort of move it from a four-year to a three-year program. Mm -hmm. um, and we're in the decision-making process on that now. Um, you know, uh, time is ticking, and each kid only has one freshman year or sophomore year. So right. we want to make sure that we get tools in the hands of kids as quickly as we can. Mm -hmm. Anything new on the horizon that parents should be aware of for the fall, besides um, what we've talked about? Sure, I have a few dates um, that I think parents and kids should be aware of. Um, so our athletic tryouts start for football um, on August 19th, mm -hmm. um, and then for the rest of the sports, the 22nd. Um, and they can see the school website for details on uh, times and locations for those tryouts and practices. Um, on August 26th, as we were just talking about the laptop um, training, so yep. the one-to-one -one laptop training for ninth grade parents and students um, is on August 26th from uh, 6 to 8, and then um, the orientation for students the next day, August 27th, for all ninth grade students, that's when they'll actually get their laptops, they'll sign their laptop handbook and get all the information okay. uh, for the one-to-one -one program. And August 27th is also picture day for all the classes and students can get their um, schedules. So that's always an exciting day. And I just I was told to remind seniors they need to get their pictures taken too for their school ID purposes. Okay. So they get their senior portraits done, but we also need a school picture for all seniors as well, and that's on August 27th. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that sounds great. Um, like I said, is there anything else you want to talk about? Uh, you know, I'm really forward? excited to be back at Hopkinton High School. Um, it's, a, it's a place of excellence, and, and I'm really proud to be in the position to lead the school into this next school year. Okay, that's great. So I just wanted to have an initial discussion, and uh, we'll look forward to working with you throughout the school year. That'd be great. I'd love to come back. Children's activities continue at the library this week. On Wednesday, July 31st, the library celebrates Harry Potter's birthday. At 3 p.m., attend the Hogwarts Academy training program with Jungle Gym. For questions or more information about any library event, visit the library website for more details. Next up tonight, a story from Hopkinton's business community with a job change for Golden Pond's executive director. For 17 years, Bill Maher has been the executive director at Golden Pond Assisted Living in Hopkinton, responsible for the overall operational and financial management of the facility located at 50 West Main Street. Having been there through the lengthy approval process for Golden Pond's expansion project and for the official groundbreaking in March of this year and the subsequent construction that is currently underway, Mar is now moving on to a new challenge and will start a new job as the executive director at Southgate at Shrewsbury, a 30-acre CCRC or Continuing Care Retirement Community in Shrewsbury that offers independent and assisted living as well as long-term care. Initially I will be going there to be the executive director of the assisted living there, help them develop special care programs, and ultimately the opportunity that I hope will eventually present itself is that there is a CEO position that oversees the entire campus operation and um, I know that the board of directors is looking for successor candidates over the next couple of years and, and that's um, ultimately the goal that I'm hoping that I can achieve. In addition to his future aspirations, Mar also spoke about what he was able to achieve during his years at Golden Pond. What makes me the most proud is how happy and satisfied the residents and the families are, as well as the fact that we were able to hire some phenomenal staff and be able to retain them long term. Um, it's, it's really a community that um, is family on many different levels and just being a part of that is really gratifying. Mar says there were also challenges along the way, many of which were tied to changes in regulations. Every time the regulations change, it makes it more difficult to provide the same level of services while trying to keep it as affordable as possible for people. So um, 
you know, when I first started here, it was a relatively new industry in Massachusetts. Um, at the time, it was relatively unregulated, which isn't always the best thing either, but the more the state stepped in and revised regulations and changed it, the more difficult it became to continue to keep it at a price point to make it available to as many seniors as possible. Most enjoyable for Mar was the opportunity to work with people, both seniors and staff, and watching them thrive. And that's continued even um, within this last month. We have somebody who had been a CNA since 1998 who just finally, after many years of um, advice and prodding, um, went to become a nurse and um, she ended up being the valedictorian in her nursing class and passed the nursing boards on her first chance and is our newest nurse now for the last couple of weeks. Um, seeing staff grow like that and also seeing so many residents do well, be here long term and, and be safe and successful um, as they continue to age has just been very rewarding. Throughout his career and time at Golden Pond, a top priority for Mar has always been people and relationships, something that he says he will miss as he moves on. People are really important, relationships are important. Um, I'm going to miss all the people that I've gotten to know for a long time and, and um, still being uh, you know, a resident of Hopkinton, um, I hope that I have plenty of opportunities to come back and, and visit with those people. As a resident of Hopkinton, he also plans to continue his connection to the Hopkinton community. I've lived here now for a dozen years. Um, I have lots of friends um, and that's the relationship that I always wanted to have with people. I didn't want it to be that I knew people from a business perspective amongst the people that I live with. Um, they're still going to be friends for a long time. I'm going to be here a long time and I want to do everything that I can still in the town and, and stay as involved as, as possible. And while leaving Golden Pond prior to the completion of the expansion project, Mars says he still gets satisfaction from knowing he helped to move the project along. It's been incredibly re rewarding to be able to have um, worked with the ownership group to get the approvals that are necessary from the town to um, have moved from the groundbreaking all the way through into uh, well into the construction. Um, so much is done. The, the target at this point is to be open before October 15th. I believe that that goal will be met and there are lots of wonderful people that are still here that will help to um, make the to help the community grow um, there's plenty of people here to help welcome new families into the community as the new units open and I look forward to coming back for the open house and the grand opening to, to see the finished product and Mars interview would not be complete without thanking those groups in the Hopkinton business community that helped him along the way. There's so many people. I mean, the Chamber of Commerce was wonderful. They were a huge help through the whole approval process. Um, the, the approvals from the CBA, from the planning board, the support from uh, the town manager and the selectmen, um, the entire community really wanted to see this happen and they wanted it to happen in the right way for the town. Um, as a resident of the town, I also wanted it to happen in the right way and I believe that the finished product is going to um, fit well with the character of the town and be a real resource to the residents and their families. And now, before we sign off tonight, a quick look at July in Hopkinton in photos from the HCAM shoot. July was another busy month in Hopkinton with many fun activities for the entire family to enjoy. As America celebrated the 4th of July, Hopkinton held the Horribles Parade down Main Street. 
The parade has been a Hopkinton tradition for over 80 years and features floats that poke fun of Hopkinton issues. This year's theme centered around patriotism. And on the 12th, 21 motorcyclists took off from the fire station to take part in the 4th annual Heather Lynn Super Memorial Ride in Meredith, New Hampshire. The event, which is held in memory of Hopkinton High graduate Heather Siebert, who passed away in 2009 at the age of 24 after an extended illness, raised over $13,000 for the Heather Lynn Siebert Patient Support Fund at Boston Children's Hospital. Throughout the summer, including in July, the new Hopkinton Farmer's Market on the Town Common has attracted several local vendors and patrons. And all summer long, the fun at the Common has continued with concerts on the Common, including this July 14th concert by soft rock band Black Marmot. Also throughout the summer, the library has encouraged kids to dig into reading with their various theme programs, including this one held on the 15th about underground mammals. And summer wouldn't be complete without construction on the roads, including the temporary closure of Route 85 on the Hopkinton Southboro line on the 12th through the 15th. To see and read about many of these stories, plus more in greater detail, visit the HCAM website, hcam.tv. And to see more photos from around Hopkinton, visit the HCAM photo website, seenandhopkinton.org. Reporting for HCAM News, I'm Stephanie Kane. And that wraps up this week's edition of HCAM News, keeping Hoppington up to date with the latest local happenings. I'm Michelle Murdoch, and for the HCAM News team, that's your news, Hopkinton.